Good afternoon. We are pleased to have you join us for another pertinent conversation, uh, discussion on the power of student voice. Uh, the Students for Equitable Change, also known as C Summit, uh, look at our shirts, <laughs> uh, was an historic event uh, that engaged students as leaders, designers, and facilitators of authentic professional learning. Today, we will discuss the value of student voice in addressing the inequities of education, structures, policies, and practices, and how, to, how a student-led summit can be possible in a community near you. I am Dwayne McClary, the director of the League of Innovative Schools. Uh, the League of Innovative Schools is Digital Promises' flagship in initiative, and over the past 10 years, we have grown into a robust, close-knit close dynamic network of 114 public schools in 34 states and representing a little over 3.4 million students and growing as we speak. So today on the panel with me, I am so excited to, to uh, welcome Mr. Marlon Stiles. He is the superintendent of Middletown City Schools in Ohio and Ms. Julie Mitchell, superintendent of Roland Unified uh, School District in California. So I'm going to let you guys introduce yourself a little more. Tell me a little bit about your districts, um, and then we'll jump into why we are here. Uh, I'm a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't expect anything less, Marlon. Uh, I'm Julie Mitchell. I'm the proud superintendent of the Roland Unified School District. It's located in Los Angeles County. Um, we serve 12,588 students. It's a TK-12 plus adult district. Um, and we have a very diverse student population. Um, as well as a very diverse socioeconomic population that we serve. And so I'll let Marlon share a little bit about his district, and then we'll share about our story with the C-Summit. Good afternoon, everyone. Marlon Stiles, proud superintendent of Middletown City School District, located southwest Ohio, 15 minutes up the street from Matt Miller right in the back. Matt, thanks for being here. Uh, we're a proud urban district, 100% free and reduced lunch rate. Um, love everything about kids, fight for kids, advocate for kids. This was a great opportunity to partner with a good friend of mine, Julie Mitchell, and do something special for kids. So excited to share today. Thanks for being here. Marlon, could you tell us a little bit about what is the C Summit? What is this that we're about to view on the, on the video? Should we tell or should we watch? What, what do you think? I'll give them a little background what it is. A little background. <laughs> um, one day we called Julie on the phone, or we text Julie, and she answered. She answered. <laughs> um, I said, hey, you got a crazy idea. So Julie and I spent a lot of time talking about how can we, um, after the, the, de uh, the murder, I should say, of George Floyd, how can we amplify our students' voice instead of just listening to what they have on their mind? Um, we wanted to find a way to create a platform that gave the kids um, the arena to really inspire educators across the country to make their environments in the classrooms more inclusive. Uh, so we came up with the idea of C-Summit, Students for Equitable Education, Truly inspired by students from across the country, from all walks of life, representing all types of school districts, north, south, east, and west. Um, it really created a platform to come together for kids to educate educators um, on how to transform their practices and their classrooms so they had a stronger sense of belonging. I think before we show that video, I think one of the important pieces is it was entirely student-led. So our goal for Marlon and I um, and the cadre of adults that came together to support students was to elevate student voice. And so they came up with the title of C-Summit. They, they shared what they felt was important to them to help us as adults transform our schools. And so it was the C-Summit, which was, again, named by them. Um, we had a lot of support from the league and from Digital Promise and from, like I said, a cadre of other adults. But our entire role was to elevate students. And we were there as facilitators and learners, and our students were our teachers. All right. So I'm going to show you a little bit about what we saw and what happened at C-Summit. What do you see when you look at me? Do you see a black girl? Do you see an athlete? Maybe you see a young girl with an attitude. But I hope you see a strong, determined young woman who will someday be your future surgeon. What do you see when you look at me? What do you see when you look at me? Do you see a Hispanic gay teenager? Do you see someone who is a first-generation undocumented student in their family? 
Maybe you see someone who always seems to carry a smile on their face and a very outgoing person. I hope you see someone who wants to become a future pediatrician. What do you see when you look at me? What do you see when you look at me? Do you see a Filipino? Do you see a thespian? Maybe you even see me as that sleep deprived senior in high school. But I honestly hope you see me as a future educator. What do you see when you look at me? What do you see when you look at me? Do you see a Korean American high school student? Do you see an extroverted individual who aims to bring positive change to his community? Maybe you see enthusiasm, passion, energy. I hope you see an aspiring lawyer who will defend those who most need the law's protection. What do you see when you look at me? What do you see when you look at me? Oh, we can, we can snap it up, clap it up. That's the power of student voice. So I know, uh, Marlon, you reached out. Uh, it was after a league convening. And you said, Dwayne, I have an idea. Me and Julie have an idea. Let's, let's do it. And I was like, sure. <laughs> what, what do you want, Marlon? <laughs> um, but Digital Promise immediately jumped in, and, and we made sure that we got everyone together, and we supported it 100%. Um, and provided a platform for these students. So tell me a little bit about the process. What, how did you get these students together? How many districts were involved? Like, what happened? Yeah, do you, you want to talk about the data and sure. all the process? Yeah, sure. So um, in, in the end, we had um, six states, nine school districts that were involved. It were 54 students that participated in the summit and about 45 adults that came together to support. Um, and so, again, it started with our two districts, and then we began reaching out to other districts, uh, other district superintendents in other states, pitching our idea. Um, and we're in the middle of COVID when all of this is happening. Our schools are closed. Um, we're, we're dealing with a few other things on our plates, um, but we knew that this was something that was important. We didn't realize, I, I'll say I didn't realize how important it was to our students until the end when we were debriefing and the students really found this opportunity as one of their lifelines through COVID as an opportunity to connect and the friends that they made across states, across districts, across genders, across ethnicities and races and orientations, uh, the students really bonded because they were, they were not in um, groups with their own district. They were spread out around the topics that they were most passionate about that they had created, that they believed we needed to know more about. It was a very diverse group of students. You had black students, white students, Arab students, Muslim students, all speaking to what they want their educations to look like. Um, so tell me a little bit about the design process. So I know that the, the kids came up with all of the titles, the topics, and what they want their sessions to look like. So tell me a little bit about that process, because that was tedious. Yeah, so uh, credit to Nathan O'Neill, uh, Richland too, first of all, who really facilitated the whole process uh, with the students. Uh, the way we left it out on the table is we just presented a problem of practice to the students. Um, and all it simply was designed to do was to start dialogue. And then we took a huge step back and they stole the show. Uh, but the key to, to what Nathan came up with, he came up with a process that took kids and put them in work groups uh, based on their areas of passion. Uh, we had some mentors, Trisha being one who's in the room, shout out to Trisha in the back. Uh, but mentors just simply help the kids navigate the design process to come up with their content for their session, come up with the material for their session to be prepared for the presentation itself. Uh, so, so really an important piece to this, I know we want to try to reiterate this next, this upcoming round, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that here shortly. Uh, but, but a key piece is the presence of mentors, right? Uh, We've got some vendors in the room, some practitioners in the room, whatever your stakeholder group you represent, being accessible to kids was the most important piece. A, because they want to hear your story as they're thinking about how to inspire you through their stories. So being present is, is key. Uh, but more importantly, being there to help them navigate um, the space so A, it's safe for them to feel like they have a sense of belonging, but B, so they can be their authentic selves and tell their story um, in the key moment when it comes to inspired educators, what was the most important. 
think one of the things also that was um, a learning experience for me is as adults, we really wanted the, f the floor to be students, for them to have their voice. And as we were um, working with them on process and design and their goals and, and really having very candid and very honest conversations around the inequities that we have in our schools and the issues that we have in our schools from their point of view, from their perspective, um, they were a little shy at first around telling their stories. And we had taken a step back because we wanted, again, we, our goal was to facilitate and support their voice. But they asked us to tell our stories first. They wanted to make sure it was a safe space for them. And so they asked us to share our stories for us to be vulnerable, to you know, get, get down and, and tell them some of our experiences so that they, they in turn could feel more comfortable because this was done entirely on Zoom. We, this is the first time we've met in person, um, all of us. Um, and so we built a family and a relationship and a trust network completely through uh, Zoom. So our students, unless they went to the same high school, didn't, hadn't met each other and so forth, and they were being extremely transparent and vulnerable with each other. Yeah, okay. So you have kind of taken a concept of, of student-informed practices um, and creating a prototype of like professional, professional learning that, that, that centers student voice. Marlon, what motivated you to pioneer this work in your to, 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 for you to expand this to multiple districts. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a proud black man, I say loud and clear. Um, you saw some students on the video also who uh, are very proud of who and what they are and what they stand for. Um, when George Floyd was murdered um, in, in our community, I saw students organize a rally and march. Um, I saw people from all walks of life, adults I'm talking about now, that were for or against what they were wanting to do. Um, when we gave kids the safe space to go ahead and march, um, and we supported them with all the right supports, right? We had to block streets, all the other good stuff. Really spoke to my heart watching them up there on the stage with the microphone talking to the community. Um, after the league convening the most recent one, I really spoke in my head just knowing that we had some other kids that wanted deeper experiences. At the same time, um, I also been paying attention to the, the profession um, we had so many educators who were saying, it's now time for us to do the work. But for some reason, there was an excuse in the profession to not actually do the work. So in my, my head, I thought, what better time than to allow the kids to have the platform to do the work that is supposed to impact their educational experience. So um, a lot went into it. Uh, could not have done it alone. Um, it was just an idea, but it was our idea together. Mm -hmm. so I, do you want to give Julie a so, whole so lot of credit? So Julie, you know, I know how Marlon persuades us. <laughs> so what motivated you other than Marlon's persuasion <laughs> to, to do the work? So I pride myself very much as being an out-of-the-box thinker and progressive in, in my thinking and ideas, and I am a huge advocate of student voice. Um, and I, I can always learn so much. We can always learn so much from our students, and I knew that there were there was change that was needed within our within my local district. We do a lot with student voice and the opportunity for students to share with us how we can improve our practices and improve the environment for them because they are the reason that we're there. But this was an opportunity to do it on a much larger scale, in a much um, broader perspective with colleagues that had a similar interest in really elevating student voice. And, and Marlon is incredibly persuasive, as you know. Um, but he, you know, really, it, it was literally, it was a, at first, I think it might have been an email that says, what do you think? And then a text and then a couple phone calls. And we did not know what we were doing. Um, we, and every meeting, we would debrief afterwards and say, okay, let's tweak this, let's change this, let's do this. Um, and we had the support of so many people um, to, to make it happen for students and to make the C Summit come to life. But it was, it was a learning experience for us, a learning experience for our students, and hopefully a learning experience for those that participated. Awesome, awesome. Why is it important to share student perspectives on social justice and equity? And how do you foresee your work of the C Summit continuing in the future? I was trying to be a gentleman there. <laughs> Sticking with that theme. 
I think for me, the most important piece is um, I attended one key session. It just sticks out in my mind, clear as day. And the title of the, the session from the C Summit, you can check it out on the website, was Why, why, do, why Does Black Lives Matter? Right? And imagine that topic in a classroom, in a school building. Imagine the potential backlash someone may experience present day. Um, but as I listened to kids and why they wanted to have that particular session, not, not the content, whole other conversation, but the reason why they were so passionate about having a session for educators about why black, my, black Lives Matters, I think it speaks to the real purpose of why something like this is, is needed in education, right? I mean, look at us right now. We're talking about educating children. There's no children in the room, right? I attended a, a couple different sessions out there, but there's no, no children. Um, this is a, an opportunity for us to reimagine we talk about transforming practices, uh, being innovative, all the key phrases in education, but specifically if we want to give kids better access to make their dreams come true, um, this was a, a, a sense of urgency that the two of us had to create a platform where kids could transform practice to create a better sense of urgency so they felt a stronger sense of belonging. Um, so, so really thinking about this whole concept, thinking about what it could potentially morph into or iterate into uh, the power behind this is that it is 100% student-led, 100% student-created. So if you are thinking about supporting this in the future, uh, knowing that this is coming deep down in the hearts of the children that we're here to talk about today, um, the potential products that are on the market that will serve them in the future. Um, so having an environment where our black and brown, our LGBTQ students, first generation, um, whatever it may be at the table, uh, really pushing us as adults to reimagine what we want to do for them based off of what it is they so desire, I think is what's most critical about this whole concept. Kids. Awesome. How have you begun to address the inequities of educational structures, policies, and practices in your district um, that were informed by your participation in, in leading the C Summit? Like, how has that transformed your thinking and how you're moving the needle in your district? So we, um, we, I did have some teachers from the district that were participated, that participated, attended the C Summit. Um, I had students that were involved and were um, on panels and teaching and so forth. And I had other students who attended as participants because we allowed students to also attend the conference. Um, and from there, we have begun smaller conversations. We're going to do a similar C Summit just in our school district with our students. Um, there are a few challenges with that because the students are very vulnerable and they're having conversations about inequities and, and challenges that they had and their audience are their own teachers. So we're, we're trying to work through some of those potential challenges that we have. Um, but within specific school sites, some of the teachers who attended are now having these conversations with students and there are equity summit leaders on campuses or equity leaders that are on campuses. There are environments for students to be able to speak up, have conversations, um, and feel safe doing so. We've identified people on campuses that students know that they can go to if they feel that there's an issue or that there's a problem that's occurred. Um, and it's not, it's not enough. It's the, you know, to have a person that you can feel that you can go to is not enough, but it's about a start. It's about you know, paving the way and creating that environment for students and allowing them the voice that they have and deserve and need. Because again, we're, we're only there to serve them. And if we're not doing our best work on their behalf, we're not doing our job. And so we must listen to their voice. We must listen to what they have to say and we have to change we can absolutely do better for students, and there is no better time than now. Wow, right? Um, it's hard to follow, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's hard to, you th throw it down, Julie, throw it down, I'll drop it, throw it down. Uh, we, we just finished a, a four-year visioning process, uh, really equity being centered at the, the core of our vision. Um, it was never about values or beliefs, it was about the work. Uh, so, so as a, a spinoff of the C Summit, we were positioned as a school district to really publicize our equity, I'm sorry, that's bad vocabulary, our inequities 
uh, the findings that we discovered as a school district. You know, we can go out in the district now and say that 18.8 percent of our student body is African American, but they make up 35 percent of our discipline incidents, not suspensions or expulsions. Uh, but but val our values and beliefs allowed us to lean heavily in on systemically where our inequities um, were, were found. The luxury that we now have is with the C Summit being present and several of our students participating, um, it really has encouraged our community to welcome our black and brown students to the table uh, to give them a voice and listen uh, versus putting programs or potential solutions in place. Um, our community now, school system included, is now listening first and trying to respond to our black and brown population before we try to determine any type of desired outcomes, solutions, or any type of programs we want to offer for our students. Um, it's shifting the community to become more student-centered. So if we have a district out here that's thinking about doing a student-led conference or having students more involved in, in developing curriculum, um, I have a pet peeve, like districts always say, we, our curriculum is student-led and student-driven, but not one student reviewed it. <laughs> but that's another, <laughs> that's another conversation, another session. Um, but what would you tell the district that's thinking about doing this? What, what's the first step in, in even starting this process? And, and, and another caveat to that, how do you always make sure that you're including the most marginalized? So one of the things, so first I would say if you're interested, just call Marlon. <laughs> That'd start there. I'll, I'll give you a cell phone number after the session if you need it. Um, you're welcome. Um, the, I, I, in all seriousness, I, if, if I'm happy to, if somebody wants to know any other details after the session or to, to you know, to call or email and I'd be happy to share because it really, it was a learning experience and trying to replicate it in your own district. I, I'm coming across some challenges that we didn't have on a national level. Um, but in terms of, of looking at um, including student voice, we very intentionally, we in our district, we have already a process for student voice and we very purposefully and intentionally select students um, from a very diverse group. So we look at our free and reduced lunch population, we look at ethnicities, we look at races, we look at language, we look at homeless population, we look at LGBTQ, we look at a variety of these things and we make sure that in the group of conversation, we have our ASB student, we have our, our at promise student, which is what we call an at risk student. The, we have our students that are A plus, we have our students that are failing, we have our homeless students, we have our wealthy students, all together in the room having a conversation so that there is, it starts with, an, with the, the group being diverse. So, because oftentimes, the easy solution is we walk out to our ASB classroom and we have a conversation with our ASB students, but that doesn't, most often, does not represent or mirror your total student population. And so it's purposefully and intentionally um, reaching out to students who many of them are not super interested at the first knock on the door, the first time you say, hey, you know, I really want to have a conversation with you. And they're like, no, thank you, because they, they, generally don't like the conversations that you know educators have with them. They haven't had a lot of positive experiences with that. Um, so we've been doing this work for about six years um, with student voice and, and really looking at, at, at the audience that we're talking with. We're the audience, they're the speakers sharing information with us. Um, and then we, we do a lot of it in person. It takes a lot of hours, um, but it is the most important work. Um, and then we also um, allow students and provide them an opportunity to respond uh, digitally as well. So nothing takes the place of face-to-face -face and the student voice, but there's an opportunity for um, some survey types of work that we do as well. Awesome. So if you are looking to do this in your district, I highly encourage you not to consider this an event. The events happen one time. When the event's over, you walk away, you check the box, you celebrate, right, an, an event. This is all the time culture work. Um, so as you're entertaining this concept, I would encourage you to pause and think culturally where your organization is at first. Um, think about how inclusive it may or may not be and who sits at the table. Do you have black students sitting at your table? 
Do you have Hispanic, Latino students sitting at your table? Do you have all the different students who are represented in the C-Summit, for example, sitting at the table to talk culturally about what needs to happen in the district and the influence you're looking to have with the type of experience you're trying to generate? Um, that conversation and culture work, in my opinion, leads to series of events over time that really help influence the culture. Uh, think about purpose and outcome first uh, before you get excited about having an event. Just to say I had an event to give my kids a platform to talk about social justice. There was a purpose and passion behind what the kids wanted to do and why, which in my opinion, which made this experience so powerful. Right? It wasn't about adults, it was about the kids. So I, I encourage you to pause from an organization standpoint, whether you're a school district practitioner or a vendor, um, focus on culture and why, um, purpose first, um, and then find that inspiration and empower those around you uh, to be at the table to dream up a series of experiences that will change behaviors. Because at the end of the day, what the kids are asking for in all nine of the sessions, they were asking adults to do one thing, change your behaviors because your current behaviors, they cause me a problem, mm -hmm. right? And the kids own special words. So I, I would ask you to think about it from that angle. Awesome. So we could not have done this, any of this work without support of, of nonprofits and other organizations and uh, such as AASA who are supporters, uh, educating all, all learners, the Education Trust Fund, uh, Future Ready, Innovate EDU, Learning Heroes, National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, Smart Technology, and the, uh, what is this one? I keep forgetting what this one is. Um, the Women of Color um, in Education. Like, we could not have done this without that support. How important is it to get outside support, to get uh, these, the, these voices heard, or even get it funded? Um, because I know Digital Promise, we, we chipped in 100% everything, but what, what, how could you not, how, how do you, what are your approaches about getting outside help and supporting this work? First of all, Julie and I, we have a, a desire, don't text your, don't check your text message here in a little bit. We do have a desire to not make this a singular event. We do want to continue this for years to come um, in scale. Uh, we, we feel like it was a bright spot this, this past spring. We'd like to scale it based on some of the student feedback. But, but before we talk about the vendors, I think it's important to talk about why we would encourage you to consider getting on board with a project such as this. Um, we have a desire collectively, all the adults that were, are included in this experience back in the spring, we have a desire to amplify our students' voice on a very large scale across the nation. Uh, there's a sense of urgency in the profession right now to change teacher behavior, educator behavior, leadership behavior, organizational behavior. And we do not believe there's any better way to do that than to have kids at the forefront of leading that charge. Um, so the purpose behind it is so that locally, statewide, and nationally, depending on what region of this country you're part of, your, your, your organization, your following, your body that supports your body of work by supporting the C-Summit and the students who are a part of the sessions, it gives them a larger voice um, outside of just their local communities. It allows their voice to be amplified in a manner that we believe will start changing educator behavior and creating inclusive environments in every school, every classroom, every day. Uh, we need you. Um, why do we need you? Because the students who are so passionate about social justice and transforming educator practice they need you. So our call is to get as many organizations to support the C-Summit now and in the future, simply because it puts students on center stage and that it allows them to have the platform they need to transform behaviors and, and adults. Yeah, I would just say it just ex it expanded the audience. It made the audience and it, it further elevated students. Um, and as the, as the C-Summit really came to life, um, it, students began to realize that this is something. Like this is, we're starting a movement. This is like, because they didn't know what they didn't know. <laughs> we didn't know what we didn't know either. Um, and so when they started, when Digital Promise and the League came in to support the work, and when the other organizations that you mentioned came in to support the work, and they saw this huge cadre of adults that were there as volunteers to support the work, um, it was their work, their mission, their purpose, their vision, their voice. 
and it just expanded it. It it made it gave them a larger platform, and they and a realization they can and will be the ones who will change our world. Some cool things that came out of different sponsorships that, that came on board, and we, we really held true to this. If an organization approached us and said we want to sponsor, we, we, I felt like we were in a position to say it, so we did, but we, we said it, it's cool, but as long as we do a couple things for the kids, yep. right? Number one, um, c can you amplify and promote the event that's about to happen? Number two, uh, in your vendor arena, do you have the capacity to create additional environments for the voice to be activated? Do you have a podcast series? Do you have a Twitter chat? Uh, do you have the capacity to put some videos together and push out our student voice? Me Win, shout out to you and Jessica Bates for pulling this off behind the scenes. Yeah. Me Win organized an interview with C Summit students with USA Today. Come on now. Shout out the digital promise. Right? I mean, right. At, and again, go back to the purpose. The purpose was about the kids. So as you think about supporting the C Summit um, as a sponsor, really the call is for you to help the students have a platform so that their message gets out on a grander scale in any creative way that you can bring to the table. We were also really clear with folks that came forward that were interested in sponsoring that it wasn't to promote their name, Correct. their vendor, their company. They had to genuinely believe in our purpose. So um, there were some folks that we said, we love the product that you create, but this isn't the arena that, that we're, 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 we respectfully declined that opportunity because they needed to, they needed to believe in the purpose and, and support the purpose. So it wasn't about them, it was about kids. Yeah, I know when you guys approached us, you know, we, we immediately started talking. Like, this was nowhere in our budget. Like, we, this was something, an idea that came up, and we could not turn it down because we saw the power of we're having to hear our students because no one else is. So this was an opportunity. So we didn't do this for a profit because we did not make that. You know, nothing, there was no profits at all. Like everything was giving, putting it out there. So what did the students get? I see some cool shirts that I have on and, and, and they got some, some other stuff. Like tell me a little bit about the students. What was their experience? And why, why do we have these shirts? What was the reasoning to have shirts for everyone? So we wanted to make sure with, with the shirts, that was one of the ideas that, um, that all of our students because they come from different backgrounds and different environments and so forth, and we we're all going to be on camera, that they, we were, they didn't need to worry about what they had to wear, that we provided what they needed to wear for the conference um, so that they, and it created that team atmosphere. This again, you know, you, you, there's swag that's involved sometimes when you go to conferences or you're presenting and so forth, so this was their swag. Um, and again, it, there was no um, registration fee. The, the entire thing was free for participants. Participants. There was the opportunity for participants to provide a donation if they wanted to. That went all directly back to students, um, for the students. So there was, you know, little pieces that were there. Um, there were some swag boxes that we were able to put together and send to students so that they had some, some different things. But I think more than shirts, more than swag, more than a couple dollars or so forth that may, be av may have been available to them, it was the pride for me, the, the pride, the confidence, because um, there were some very shy, very quiet people who have never spoken, who felt that what they had to say wasn't important to anyone. Um, and so, and it, we didn't necessarily, I can say I, did not not handpick students. I sent information out to our high schools. I have three high schools and said, you know, this is what it's about, anyone that's there. And so I, it, one of the students happened to have been our valedictorian of one of our schools. The rest, no. Had not involved in other activities, not involved in other things with school. Um, had multiple challenges within you know, the family structure or within you know, the environments or whatever that they're growing up in. But it gave them confidence. They knew that they were important, that they were valued. And the role, I can't stress enough, the role of the facilitator coaches, the mentors, that worked with these small groups and built their confidence and reassured them that what they have to say is important um, could, and, and gave them that, um, that little nudge that they needed. 
Um, most of the students were seniors in high school. Um, that wasn't necessarily by design. It's just kind of the way that it worked out. Um, but they all have, have had some opportunities to speak after the C Summit. Um, and many of them are interested in coming back to be a part of C Summit 2, um, either as coach facilitators, student guides, a college you know, piece to it, so that uh, it continues, the, so they can continue to see the seeds that they planted grow. The other cool part about it is, is how the adults rallied around the kids. There were so many things that came in that I don't know about you, but I was like, I don't know where we're going to get $25,000 from. Um, and then next, you know, two days later, hey, we landed this, we landed that, somebody wants to do this. Uh, a real big shout out to Chris Singleton. He provided the keynote for the event. Um, unbelievable message if you want to check out his story. Uh, he did a 15, 20 minute keynote for the students free of charge. Tell us who Chris Singleton is. Uh, Chris Singleton, I'm going to forget facts here. Um, Chris Singleton's in Southwest Ohio right now as we speak. Yeah. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the church. If you Emmanuel. Can help me out. Emmanuel Church. Um, so if you remember uh, several years ago, there was a shooting in a church, and there was a white supremacist that came in um, and shot some folks during Bible study. Uh, Chris Singleton's mother, black female, was one of the victims um, in that church. Uh, Chris Singleton has gone on to... Um, forgive and talk about the power of love and his experience uh, based off what happened to his mother. Um, he is now traveling the country to tell his experience um, and really trying to spread love across this country. So he came in knowing what the students really deep down inside were passionate about, gave a very powerful message to them uh, to really kick off and open up the Sea Summit. Um, I, I know about you, but I know we're forever grateful for what he did for the kids just this past spring. It was, it was a pretty special piece. Awesome, awesome. So C Summit 2.0 is coming soon. We are already talking about planning it. Uh, we have some, some, some huge opportunities coming up. We've had some folks approach us about what's next. And if you're interested in supporting and doing the work of students, reach out and we're happy to have you. Any last words, parting words before we close out? Be a new gentleman. <laughs> Thanks. No, I'm just, I am very excited to see this um, process continue to grow and develop and providing uh, students their, the platform for their voice. And um, just personally cannot thank Digital Promise enough because we could not have done it without your support from, from your staff, from all of it. I, it. We had an idea. We had lots of, of legwork and hours and time, but we did not know what we did not know. And without you and your support and your expertise and the finances, um, gratefully grateful that uh, it came to be. So thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to serve. I would say that on that day back in April, we had what was roughly 900 people that attended uh, the session that day, the C Summit. How many people uh, we had registered? 15. 1,500 registered, 900 plus attended virtually. Um, I would just ask that if you get inspired by anything you saw on the screen, not necessarily us today, but as you saw some of the kids, if you get inspired by their passion, um, reach out to the three of us um, as we get geared up for C-Summit 2.0. Um, this is something we believe needs to be scaled for the profession. Yeah. Um, it needs to be scaled for the profession because our kids are yearning for greater access and inclusiveness in the, in the classrooms. Um, we can have these type of conversations all day long, but until the work moves and changes the behaviors, we know we have kids that are still being blocked out um, systemically, and, that, and that's a problem for the kids in their own special words. So if you get found any, any ounce of inspiration today, please reach out. We'd love to have you on as a sponsor. More importantly, we'd love to create an avenue in which you can jump on board as a mentor for student groups. We can never have too many to to wrap their arms around the kids, which is most importantly what yeah. we need the most. Um, in any way you can help amplify their message to reach as many educators in this country is what's, what's most needed. So um, as the kids say, um, if you believe in us, um, sky's the limit for them. When they talk about students for, edu um, uh, for equitable education, they actually mean it. Um, they want the opportunities um, and they believe that if we change our behaviors as adults, they can find that pathway to success in their life and make the dreams come true. Yeah. Always welcome to the table. So any, any other industry we go to, whenever they want to look at their end product, they survey. Think about Netflix. Think about McDonald's. They reach out to their customers. As an education industry, who are our customers? Students. When was the last time you reached out to your students? That's the question. 
So continue to do right by students, and we thank you for joining us, and see you next time. <laughs>